as the impresarios were bringing people into Texas, a change in the federal government in Mexico would occur that would have a profound impact on the direction that Texas history took. The centralists are going to come to power during the late 1820s. Up until this point, during most of the 1820s, the Federalists, who believed in a weak central government and more power to the states, had dominated Mexican politics. The Federalists shared powers with the states, and they left Texas mostly alone. But in 1829, the Centralists came to power. The Centralists believed that a strong federal government, a strong national government, was more important, and that the power should rest in the national government, not the states. And the centralists, when they come to power in 1829, will issue rules that brought the states under more control by the federal government, which is going to create more tensions between the settlers and the Mexican government. One of the first places this pressure will take place is in Nacogdoches, what's known as the Nacogdoches Land Grant. A man by the name of Hayden Edwards got land and received a grant from Mexico to settle 500 families near Nacogdoches in East Texas. He said that anyone who already lived there and could not show proof of ownership of their land had to leave. That's going to cause tension because many of the people living in Nacogdoches were what were known as squatters, that they had lived on the land, but they did not own the title or the deed to the land, so they couldn't prove it, so they would lose everything that they had done there. Well, that created two sides, those that had come with Edwards and sided with Edwards and those who already existed in Nacogdoches and were opposed to Edwards. So then a mayoral election was held in Nacogdoches and you had two men, Samuel Norris, who was representing the settlers that already lived there, and Chichester Chaplin, who was on Edwards' side and was also Edwards' son-in-law. Edwards, when there's a vote, since he has the land grant to the area, will declare Chaplin the winner and the mayor of Nacogdoches. Others are going to oppose, and they're going to appeal to the Mexican official, a man by the name of Jose Antonio Salcedo, who will declare Norris the winner because Norris received more votes. Edwards, though, will refuse to recognize Norris as the mayor of Nacogdoches. Edwards is then going to leave. He's going to leave his brother, Benjamin Edwards, in charge, and Benjamin Edwards is going to further anger Mexican officials. Finally, the tensions are going to become so bad that Mexico will cancel Hayden Edwards' land grant. Well, this will anger Edwards, and in November of 1826, a few followers of Edwards will capture Edwards, Norris, and the other people in charge and charge them with crimes against the community. Norris was removed as mayor, and while they're in prison, they're going to cause the Mexican government to send troops to restore Edwards in the area. Some feel this was a trick by Hayden Edwards's people by also arresting him as a way to remove Norris from mayor and gain control for his group. So while all of this is going on, Benjamin Edwards is going to put together a small band of followers and will declare the area around Nacogdoches a new independent country, a new independent state. They will name the country the Republic of Fredonia on December 21st, 1826. The Edwards brothers are now in charge of this new Republic of Fredonia, and like some good boys, they'll name it after their mom. Their mom's name was Fredonia. And they will immediately appeal to Stephen F. Austin and his colony for help, but Austin doesn't want to have trouble with Mexico at this point, and he'll say no. So Mexico will send their army up to put down the Republic of Fredonia, when the Mexican army arrives in the Nacogdoches area, the rebellion will end because Edwards, uh, or the Edwards brothers and all of their followers will run away. Because of the Fredonian Rebellion now, though, Mexican officials are worried about all of these Americans that are coming in if they're trying to take the land away from Mexico. There are some that think that the Fredonian Rebellion was an American plot to take all of Texas away from Mexico. So the Mexican government will send General Manuel de Mier y Tehran to the area to investigate, and he will explore all over Texas, and he'll write a report that he'll send back. And in his report, he will say that the Anglo population was getting too big in Texas, and his recommendation is that Mexico needs to place troops around this, all of the settlements, they need to attract more Mexican settlers into the area, 
to guarantee that Texas will want to stay part of Mexico, and they need to develop more trade between Texas and Mexico so that Texas is economically dependent on Mexico and will not look to leave and join the United States. Another issue, though, comes up in 1829 when the president of Mexico issues a decree ending slavery in Texas. The Texans are going to be upset about this because many of them were slave owners. Many of them came as slave owners because Austin gave them extra land if they would come. And so the fact that Mexico has outlawed slavery is going to cause tensions between the Texans and Mexico and the Mexican government, and the Texans are going to refuse to give up their slaves. Meanwhile, several laws are going to be passed that are going to affect immigration to Texas and affect the direction that Texas is going. One of these first major laws is the law of April 6, 1830. Under the provisions of the law, it gave large land grants and financial assistance to immigrants from Mexico and Europe. Again, following Mieri Tehran's idea that they needed more Mexican immigrants living in Texas to balance out the numbers of Anglo-Americans that were moving in. Also, the law of April 6, 1830 stopped all immigration from the United States. It suspended all impresario grants that weren't fulfilled. It set up new forts throughout Texas, and it passed new taxes on imports from foreign countries. This is going to anger the colonists in Texas. They feel that their rights were being taken away. Um, they're also going to be upset about these taxes because they had not had to pay those before. And so they feel this is a direct attack on them. Both sides are going to distrust each other. The Anglo-American settlers in Texas are not going to trust the Mexican government, and the Mexican government is not going to trust the Anglo-American settlers in Texas. Stephen F. Austin is going to try to negotiate with the Mexican leaders, but to no avail. With these new taxes, that's going to lead to trouble, specifically in the town of Anahuac. A tax collector and Mexican soldiers are going to be assigned to collect these new taxes, one of whom is a man by the name of Juan Davis Bradburn. He was a native of Virginia, and he commanded the garrison at Anahuac. The colonists are going to accuse Bradburn of refusing to give back runaway slaves, and they accuse his men of stealing. They're mainly upset, though, because he is enforcing these taxes that Mexico has passed, and the settlers are not going to like these taxes. As the protests grow, more and more people are going to speak out. In May of 1832, Bradburn is going to arrest two lawyers who are leading a lot of the protests. One is named William B. Travis, and the other is Patrick C. Jack. And he's going to argue that they are encouraging resistance against the Mexican government. Um, when he takes them and throws them in prison, that's going to anger a lot of the settlers and two different armed groups of Texas settlers are going to march on Anahuac to free William Travis and Patrick Jack. The colonists are going to capture some soldiers and they're going to offer to trade them for Travis and Jack. Brackburn will, or Bradburn will agree, but then after receiving these captured soldiers from the Texans, he then refuses to release Travis and Jack and calls for more troops from Mexico to come and protect them. Meanwhile, in Mexico, a general, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, will lead a revolt against the Mexican government. He is a Federalist, uh, so he's leading a revolt against the Centralist government, and he is promising to support the Constitution of 1824, which gave so much power to the states. The colonists in Texas are excited, and on June 13, 1832, a group of Texas colonists are going to meet and they're going to issue a set of resolutions, what's known as the Turtle Bayou Resolutions. In the Turtle Bayou Resolutions, the Texans are going to declare their loyalty to Mexico, but not the Mexican government. They're also going to declare their support for Santa Ana. Meanwhile, Colonel Jose de las Piedras is going to arrive with troops in Anahuac, the troops that Bradburn had asked for. But de las Piedras is a Federalist, so instead of arresting the Texas colonist, he's immediately going to remove Bradburn from his power in Anahuac. He is going to release Travis and Jack, and Jose de las Piedras is going to pledge his support to Santa Ana. 
but not everybody knows this has happened. And we said there were two different groups marching on Anahuac. One of the groups is still coming. And on June 26, 1832, we're going to have a battle between Texans and Mexican troops at what's known as the Battle of Velasco. The group of Texans had gotten a hold of a cannon and they were trying to put it on a ship to sail it up to Anahuac so they could use it to attack Bradburn and help free Travis and Jack. The Mexican commander at Velasco would not let the Texans pass and as a result, a fight broke out. It was a very short but bloody battle. Several men on both sides died. Many were wounded and injured, and the Mexican forces surrendered. So the Texans are excited. They count this as a victory. They sail on up to Anahuac, and when they get there, they find out that Travis and Jack are already released. Also in 1832, Santa Ana wins in his rebellion against the government, and he is made president of Mexico. So Texas, excited about Santa Ana being president, will hold a meeting, what's known as the Convention of 1832. Fifty-five delegates will meet in San Felipe de Austin, in Austin's colony, and what they will announce is they want to resume immigration from the United States, they want to be exempt from import taxes, and they want Texas to be its own state. They will send these resolutions on, and then they'll hold another convention the next year known as the Convention of 1833, and they will send the exact same resolutions because they received no answer, and this time they're convinced that Mexico is going to support them. They will draw up a state constitution for Texas, where Texas will be its own state within Mexico, and the Convention of 1833 then will vote to send Stephen F. Austin with these resolutions to Mexico City. When Austin arrives in Mexico City, he finds it a mess. Uh, he leaves in April of 1833. He arrives in July of 1833. But the new Mexican government is not organized. Uh, he doesn't have anyone to negotiate with. There's no one in charge. He keeps getting passed around and told to come back tomorrow. Then a cholera epidemic will hit the city. So this is a large uh, epidemic, a massive health crisis. So there's no one for... Austin to negotiate with, to meet with. By October, he hadn't met with anyone else, so he had been left alone. So he will write a letter to the people in San Antonio, to the San Antonio government officials, suggesting that Texas go ahead and form its own state government, that he hadn't had anyone to talk to, but they're convinced that Mexico is going to agree to make them a state. So he sends this in October. Finally, in November of 1833, Santa Ana will agree to meet with Stephen F. Austin. He will agree to some of Texas's ideas. He will repeal the immigration restrictions, but he would not grant Texas statehood. On the way home, though, Stephen F. Austin is arrested because the Mexican officials had read the letter he had sent to Texas, saying Texas should go ahead and create a state government. Well, Santa Ana said Texas doesn't get to be a state government, even though Austin had written that before the meeting, he is accused of treason. He is accused of planning a rebellion by telling Texas to start a state government. And Stephen F. Austin is thrown in jail. And he's going to stay in jail for a year. He's going to be there until Christmas of 1834. Then when he gets out of jail, they make him stay under house arrest in Mexico City until July 11th, 1835. And he finally returns to Texas in September of 1835, almost two and a half years after he had left for Mexico. Meanwhile, in Anahuac, the people are still upset about the taxes on imports that were being enforced. Andrew Briscoe was a local merchant. He said the tax was not being enforced in other cities. It was only, be put, only being put on the people of Anahuac. He said this isn't fair. And so he comes up with a trick that he loads a ship up with bricks, makes the Mexican officials in Anahuac think that they're smuggling in goods, and when the Mexican officials run out to search the ship, they just find a ship full of bricks while on another ship, uh, Briscoe is able to sneak the supplies into Anahuac without paying the import tax. Well, the Mexican officials get upset and they arrest Briscoe for tricking them. William B. Travis who was one of the lawyers who had previously been arrested, he now is going to lead a group of soldiers from San Felipe 
to push for Briscoe's release. And these soldiers are just men, they're uh, Texas colonists, but they're going to march on Anahuac to try to force Briscoe to be released. The Mexican captain there, a man by the name of Antonio Tenorio, will release Briscoe without a fight, and he'll leave Texas with his troops because he feels this isn't an issue he's really concerned about getting hurt or shot or even killed over. So he releases him and he leaves. But the general in the San Antonio area, who's down in Cujilla, Martin, or further south in Cujilla, General Martin Perfecto de Cos, who is also Santa Ana's brother-in-law, is the commander of the forces in Cujilla. He does not like this, that the Mexican government has been stood up to, and he is going to demand that Travis and the others be arrested and turned over for military trial. He also demands the arrest of Lorenzo de Zavala, who is a Mexican political leader who had become critical of Santa Ana and the way Santa Ana was moving away from the Federalist ideas and making himself a dictator. And so Zavala had been critical of Santa Ana for that. And Koss also calls for the arrest of de Zavala. Uh, Koss then announces that he's bringing a large force into Texas to arrest Travis and Z uh, de Zavala. Now that news of Koss's army marching north into Texas, a call goes out for a meeting of Texas leaders. And Columbia, Texas, August 15, 1835, town leaders are going to call for a convention. And this convention is going to become known as the Consultation. And they will meet October of 1835 at Washington on the Brazos. And the people that come to the Consultation are divided into two groups. There's the Peace Party and the War Party. The Peace Party wanted to keep peace with Mexico. They were worried that the meeting would lead to trouble. And the War Party said, no, we need to have this meeting. So you have the group that wants to have the meeting and the group that doesn't. The goal of the meeting was to work for peace, but be prepared for war if war was inevitable. While they're all meeting at the consultation, Stephen F. Austin will return and he will throw his support behind the consultation, saying we need to talk. Austin says, Santa Ana is not who we thought he was. He is a dictator. And Austin will state, quote, war is our only recourse. There is no other remedy. We must defend ourselves and our country by force of arms. So now the consultation is going to start with that goal of should they fight or should they not fight. And that's going to lead to the big question and the major issue of the next part of Texas history.